we've got plenty of people piling in i'll just we'll give it another minute or so just be, just to start and give us all a moment to just catch our breaths maybe we could actually all just do a, a, a 30 second mindfulness that I, I might lead just while we've got everyone coming in so i'd love you to close your eyes if you feel like you want to do that otherwise just sit there i'd like you to just think about you put all your attention onto your breathing it can be useful to say to yourself from the inside i'm breathing in i'm breathing out just to capture the breath and the rhythm for you And just think about anchoring yourself to just this breath by this particular present moment as it presents itself and have a rest from all that forward thinking and all that past thinking and just focus on this particular breath by this particular uh, in this particular moment and you can always use your breath to anchor you if you're feeling a bit anxious um you can, whether you're day or night or at work or home, just take a few moments to do this sort of a, an anchoring breathing exercise. So I will, you can just open your eyes again if you want to. Whether, thanks for those who were um, joining. I was just giving it, filling a little bit of time before we, we started. So I think we've got, we've got plenty of people in. What I'll do is do my formal introduction. Um, sorry, I'm just going to get my notes up the old-fashioned version of the, the lectern. Um, so my name is Moira Junger. Um, as I said before, I want to first acknowledge the land on which we're all meeting today and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the land, their elders, past, present and emerging, and any First Nations people joining the webinar today. We at the Sleep Health Foundation acknowledge the wisdom of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, understanding of health as holistic. Aboriginal health does not mean um, uh, the physical well-being of an individual but refers to the social emotional and cultural well-being of the whole community and we draw inspiration from that so i'm very pleased to be hosting this event as part of our activities for sleep week um, our mission at the sleep health foundation is to be community facing and educate and raise awareness um, to the public about the importance of sleep for a better life our vision is to improve lives by better sleep um, we have sleep week um, and this week leading up to ironically losing an hour's sleep on the start of daylight savings tomorrow night when the clocks go forward it's just an awareness raising exercise and a chance to put sleep and all the relevant sleep topics under the spotlight and today's theme is mental health and sleep so i'm really delighted to have a fantastic star started panel um, for you and for me to have a dis um, for me to have a discussion with these panelists and for you to hear just from the horse's mouth the kind of stuff that's going on within this topic of, of sleep and mental health so we've invited panel members with considerable experience and expertise to discuss um, their work and, and their views on on this field too so each panel member will have approximately 10 minutes of a presentation giving an overview of their area of interest and expertise and then all together at the second half hour We'll have a discussion and then time for questions from you we've got uh, several questions already from the audience thanks for sending those in um i'd imagine we won't get time for all of the questions so i'm going to commit to you um i will actually write back to everyone if we didn't get to your question we're going to package this up have it on our website and have resources attached to it um that's if it all goes well and the recording's fine etc so I, I I'll introduce every speaker. I mean, just want to say hello, of course, to, to them. For um, we, we've got Dr. Elizabeth Mason, and we've got Dr. Melinda Jackson, and we've got um, we've got Dr. Mike Millard. So our first speaker for today is Dr. Elizabeth Mason, and she's a senior clinical and research psychologist at the Clinical Research Unit for Anxiety and Depression, and this way up at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. She's also a conjoint lecturer at the University of New South Wales. And Dr. Mason, Liz to us, is particularly interested in the relationship between disrupted sleep and emotional disturbance, as well as mechanisms underlying anxiety, mood and sleep disorders in order to improve treatments for these disorders. In 2012, she completed her postdoctoral research in the Sleep and Mood Lab at the University of California in Berkeley. Lucky duck. So Liz has got ex extensive experience in the development of internet-based treatments for mental health disorders, including the creation of This Way Up Managing Insomnia Program. 
So I will stop speaking and hand over to you, Liz. Thanks so much, Moira. Always good to get an opportunity to talk about sleep. I'll just share my slides now. Is that showing up okay? Great. <coughs> So one of the reasons I became interested in sleep was some time ago when I used to watch The Simpsons, uh, I had this experience where I was really sleep deprived and I noticed I was crying at an episode of The Simpsons and I thought, well, that's kind of an overreaction. And I started to get me wondering what's going on here between sleep and emotion. Now, certainly we know that there is um, an important link between insomnia and sleep and psychiatric disorders. So insomnia itself is very common. About 10% of the population have insomnia. And it frequently co-occurs with anxiety and depression. So we know that people with insomnia are nine times more likely to have clinically significant depressive symptoms and 17 times more likely to have clinically significant anxiety symptoms. At our own clinic at St Vincent's Hospital in, um, in Sydney, which is primarily an outpatient clinic for anxiety and depression, we, we were interested in how many of these people actually also have <laughs> insomnia. And so we just looked at people presenting for at the clinic looking for treatment. And what we found was that 40% of these people come into the clinic saying, I've got a problem with anxiety, help me with my anxiety. Actually, all had 40% of them also had clinical levels of insomnia. And across the board, those people with clinical insomnia, those are the black bars represented here, they had more severe symptoms of anxiety, depression and disability. What seems to be the case is that there's a bi-directional relationship between sleep disturbance and emotion dysregulation. So each one affects the other. So starting off thinking about how emotion dysregulation affects sleep disturbance. So of course we've all had the experience of being anxious or ruminating about something or worried about something and it's been harder for us to sleep. This has also been shown experimentally. So <laughs> experiments where they induce worry or rumination in normal sleepers have been shown to increase sleep impairment. So for example, in one study, the Gross and Berkovic study, um, they, they had participants take a nap and one group of participants were told they would have to do a, sleep, a, a, a speech at the end of the nap. Now, for most people, that's pretty anxiety provoking and participants in that group took longer to fall asleep and slept for less time than people in the control condition. Now looking at the, um, at the other side of the coin, so how sleep disturbance might affect emotion dysregulation. And this is a study I really like that comes out of Matthew Walker's lab at the University of California, Berkeley. And it, it perhaps gives some clues as to why I had that overreaction while watching The Simpsons when sleep deprived. So in this study, they had two groups. Uh, one group slept through the night, um, had a nice night of sleep, and the other group was sleep deprived for the whole night. The next day, they put all the participants in an MRI scanner. So this allowed them to look at activity in the brain. And the task for participants, excuse me, <coughs> the task for participants was a very simple one. It was just to look at these pictures that range from neutral to negative, and they had to rate them as either neutral or negative. So perhaps unsurprisingly, people who were sleep deprived had a bias towards rating those images more negatively. <clears throat> now, what's interesting is when we look at the brain activity, so let's first look at the sleep control. So these are people who slept through the night and when they looked at the negative images, um, what we see in the brain is that there was activity in their amygdala. And that's exactly what we expect to, to see. So the amygdala is kind of the emotion center of the brain, particularly important in, in kind of detecting negative um, threats in our environment. But what's really interesting is in that sleep deprived group, what they found was a 60% increase in that amygdala activation to those negative images. So to summarize their results, what they found was the sleep deprivation results in 
an amplified response by the human amygdala to negative emotional stimuli. And they also found that there was a loss, loss of functional connectivity between the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is important in our brains for kind of those higher level executive functioning. So it helps us to regulate our emotions. So what they were seeing there was in the sleep deprived group, that section of the brain wasn't really communicating as well with our emotion center. So I, I think that's a great study. I do though want to just make the point for anyone who's starting to get worried about this, that it, the odd night of sleep is, is certainly not harmful. In fact, it's very normal to have the odd night of poor sleep. Um, I also want to make the point, and that's what I'm going to talk about now, is, is to say that, you know, there's also some very good treatments out there for sleep disorders. So I'm going to focus more on insomnia, but Melinda, who's speaking next, is going to talk a little bit about sleep apnea. So when it comes to insomnia, the gold standard treatment for insomnia is cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT for insomnia. And that's widely recognized as um, the first line treatment for insomnia from doctors to psychologists, it's now accepted that that really should be what people with insomnia should be getting as their treatment. <laughs> Just briefly, CBT for insomnia is a combination of techniques that targets the thoughts and behaviors that maintain insomnia. So uh, it helps patients to develop behaviors that promote sleep, so it helps them to reassociate the bed with uh, with sleep uh, rather than dread. It helps them to get reestablish their regular circadian rhythms. And importantly, it also helps patients to learn ways to reduce that worry and, re and preoccupation with sleep that we know really leads to kind of increased levels of arousal, making that sleep harder. More recently, there's, there's really a lot of evidence that's showing that CBT, which normally or typically was previously delivered face to face, can actually be delivered online. So this is um, the front page of a UK newspaper just this year. And on the front page with the headline, doctors to give sleep app rather than pills. So I think you know, having that as the front page of the newspaper is really highlighting how um, accepting people are becoming of, of this as a way of delivering treatment. Here in Australia, one of the main programs we have is um, the program that Mike and I are involved in, which is the This Way Up program. Um, it's a not-for-profit joint initiative between St Vincent's Hospital and the University of Sydney. I know Mike's going to talk a little bit more about that, um, so I won't I won't say much much more on that. But um, CBT, I, I probably should have said, is a structured and short-term treatment, and this program involves four lessons that we get people to do over about eight weeks. Okay, so before I finish up, I wanted to share some research that we've done recently. So <clears throat> as I've said before, we know that anxiety and insomnia frequently co-occur. And um, one thing that we were interested in looking at is in that common case of a patient with anxiety and insomnia, what, what treatment is likely to lead to the best outcomes? We know that CBT for anxiety helps with insomnia symptoms, and we know that CBT for insomnia helps with anxiety symptoms, but which is likely to kind of be the optimal treatment. So what we did in this study is we randomized 120 people to receive either an online program for anxiety or an online program for insomnia. <clears throat> and I'll just kind of be brief. Um, what we found was at the end of treatment, the insomnia treatment was more effective in reducing symptoms of insomnia than the anxiety treatment and equally effective in reducing symptoms of anxiety. Those treatment gains were maintained at that follow-up uh, three months later, although at that point there was no difference between groups. So both groups were doing equally well. So what we might conclude from that is that for individuals presenting with comorbid anxiety and insomnia, treatment for insomnia may be the most efficient treatment strategy. Um, just finally, uh, another group of researchers, Kirsten Blom's group in Sweden, actually looked at a very similar question quite a few years ago now, but they looked at it in people with insomnia and depression. And what they did was randomize patients to either receive internet-based treatment for insomnia or internet-based treatment for depression. 
and they found that after treatment, people who received treatment for insomnia had significantly lower levels of insomnia than those who received treatment for depression. And there was no difference between the groups in terms of their depression levels. So um, what we might kind of conclude from, from these studies together is that um, I think, you know, it's really showing just how valuable treating sleep can be. And I'll leave it there and hand back over to you, Moira. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. That's fantastic. A great, great overview. I'm just going to introduce our next speaker. Do I go? Sorry, do I? Oh, stop, chef. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, thanks so much, Liz. We've got um, Dr. Melinda Jackson, who's going to speak about um, sleep disorders and mental health. And Delo uh, Delo Dr. Melinda Jackson is a sleep psychologist and head of the Sleep Cognition and Mood Laboratory at the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health at Monash University in Melbourne. Her research examines the impact of sleep loss and sleep disorders on cognition, mood and brain health and explores the impact of different treatment approaches to address sleep issues in the community and clinical populations, such as patients with obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, and mild cognitive impairment. So over to you, Mel. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Moira. And um, thanks again for the opportunity to present uh, on this really important topic. Um, I'm going to change focus a little bit um, now and turn your attention to another sleep disorder, obstructive sleep apnea, and really just have three kind of take home messages for you. Um, the first is around um, the prevalence of mental health issues in, in people um, with obstructive sleep apnea. So for those of you who may not be familiar, um, OSA is a highly prevalent sleep breathing disorder and it occurs when the upper airway collapses during sleep and this causes pauses in the person's respiration um, and this leads to drops and dips in their oxygen levels. And once their brain senses these drops in oxygen levels, um, it, they, it kind of wakes the person up from those deeper stages of sleep to lighter stages of sleep and, and kind of causes these arousals um, in their sleep. And this can lead to fragmented sleep patterns. Now, most of the time, the person isn't aware of these awakenings. And this cycle can occur for hundreds of times um, each night. So you can imagine someone who's experiencing this disorder can feel pretty sleepy um, the next day and they can often report sort of memory problems, difficulties concentrating. And what I find really interesting about this disorder, which is essentially a respiratory um, condition, is the impact that it also has not only um, in terms of health risks, in terms of, um, such as cardiovascular disease and stroke, but the impact that it has on the brain and um, in particular on the mental health of people who experience this disorder. So there's been a whole range of studies conducted looking at um, the prevalence of anxiety and depressive symptoms in people with sleep apnea who are untreated, um, including some work by my team. And these studies have recently been pulled. Um, and, and when we looked at the pool, when you look at the pooled prevalence of um, anxiety in OSA, it's around 32%. And for depressive symptoms, it's around 35%. So this is quite high considering, um, you know, the population levels are going to be much lower than this, maybe around 10%. What we did as to the sort of follow on from um, this kind of uh, examination of more of these self-reported um, symptoms, we conducted a study where we looked at um, people who'd been recently diagnosed with sleep apnea and conducted a, a structured clinical interview for depression so that we could get a bit more of an understanding of the clinical levels of, of depression um, in these patients. And what we found was that 23% of our sample met criteria for a current depressive um, episode and around a quarter of our patients um, were already using antidepressants. And quality of life was something that was really a significant predictor of depression as well in this population. So as um, Liz has beautifully explained, you know, there's this likely bi-directional relationship between um, sleep apnea and depressive um, symptoms, but also shows that there's heightened sort of clinical levels of depression in this population as well. 
The second point I wanted to make is that there's now growing evidence from longitudinal studies that sleep disorders can actually precede the onset of mental health conditions as well. So there's been um, a lot, number of studies that have looked at longitudinal data in people with insomnia um, and have shown that the insomnia is linked to a two to fourfold increased risk of new onset depression and anxiety. And one of the studies that um, I conducted a few years ago where we used data from the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health, and we had almost 10,000 young Australian women, we found that women who reported um, sleeping difficulties often in their early 20s had a fourfold increased risk of having a depression diagnosis 10 years later. And this was double that for women who reported um, not experiencing any sleeping problems or only rare sleeping difficulties. The important point here is that this is new onset depression diagnosis. So we actually excluded any women who'd had a previous mental health issue. Similarly, when we look at individuals with obstructive sleep apnea, there's been a couple of longitudinal studies that have also identified OSA as an independent risk factor for depression. And in this study by Chen and colleagues, um, this graph here shows the incidence rates of depressive disorder amongst patients with obstructive sleep apnea in the solid line um, compared to um, non-sleep um, apnea patient controls. And during this one year follow up, um, there was a, a two, the, the, there was a doubling of the incidence of, of um, depression, depressive disorder diagnosis, um, yeah, just over this one year period from their diagnosis. So these studies highlight the importance of potentially treating sleep early to prevent the development of mental health issues, or at least reduce the severity um, of these issues down the track. And so sleep is this potentially modifiable factor that we can use to try and reduce mental health burden in the community. And this is a really exciting kind of emerging area of research. Um, and there's more studies now coming out to, to support this. So finally, I just wanted to talk about treatment of sleep disorders and how that might improve um, mental health outcomes. So the gold standard treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is continuous positive airway pressure or um, CPAP. And um, it's where the patient needs to wear a mask each night and room air is pumped into the mask and into their airway, which holds the airway open and allows them to breathe normally. And um, there's been a number of studies showing now that uh, using CPAP treatment can um, significantly reduce depressive symptoms. As a follow on from our study where we looked at clinical levels of depression in sleep apnea patients, um, we actually randomized patients to either CPAP or a wait list group. And what we found was those who had um, been using CPAP for four months had a significant reduction um, in their depressive symptoms compared to the wait list group. But importantly, we found that participants um, in the CPAP group, um, there were, the proportion of them meeting criteria for a major depressive episode reduced from 21% to 7% in that four month period. So this is very preliminary, but exciting evidence to, to show that CPAP might actually also improve um, that major depression. And finally, I just want to touch on another area of interest of mine is in mindfulness for insomnia. And mindfulness is the intentional act of present moment awareness without attachment to an outcome. And we've had a, a great example of this at the beginning of the webinar. And this approach can really help address the racing mind and, and sort of mental chatter that, that patients with um, insomnia often experience, but also help them to accept um, their sleep difficulties as well. And mindfulness um, approaches have been packaged up as a therapy um, as called mindfulness-based therapy for insomnia. Uh, and this is a six or eight week program um, which uses comprehensive mindfulness training, both formal and informal meditations with an emphasis on daily practice. And there's, it also incorporates um, some components of CBTI that um, Liz has uh, described. It's usually delivered in a group format and has been shown to benefit um, patients in terms of their insomnia severity and also mood outcomes as well. There's also some evidence um, that we've recently um, provided a review on showing that mindfulness-based interventions can be beneficial for sleep in people who have comorbid mental health conditions. 
So um, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about a really exciting digital version of MBTI that's been developed by Dr. Giselle Withers, um, A Mindful Way to Healthy Sleep. And this is a six week online MBT program. And we conducted an independent evaluation of this program and we found that there were significant improvements in insomnia symptoms in, in people who completed the program compared to a waitlist control. And there was a 75% um, remission rate in our participants who were in the program, um, showing that they had uh, their, their, their levels of um, insomnia had improved significantly and no longer met criteria. So this is very preliminary evidence, but it shows that there are some benefits of these types of interventions for improving sleep. Mm -hmm. um, we also found some improvements in their mood as well. And it's great to see that there's um, a growing range of evidence-based treatments available to the community, including these digital-based interventions to improve sleep, but um, also potentially reduce mental health burden. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much, Mal. That was a again a really wonderful overview um, of yeah looking at the sleep disorders and and impact on mental health and again the bi-directional relationship. So thank you very much. Um, our final speaker or panelist, and we'll get to our sort of more informal chats soon. And 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 Mike's not going to have slides. It's going to be more more of a chat. Um, this is Dr. Mike Millard, and Dr. Mike Millard is the director of This Way Up. Um, a part of the Clinical Research Unit for Anxiety and Depression at St. Vincent's Hospital, Sydney and U University of New South Wales. He is a consultant psychiatrist and senior lecturer with a particular expertise in youth and adult mental health and emerging and innovative treatment. Dr. Mike is passionate about developing, evaluating and implementing treatment that enhances accessibility, long-term impacts and is empowering. So this way up is Australia's largest provider of digital mental health treatment. So Mike will give us the medical perspective, medications, et cetera, um, and perhaps, you know, diagnosis, digital technology, access, whatever you'd like to talk about, Mike. Over to you. Uh, that all sounds very grand. <laughs> <laughs> Moira. Look, and uh, what a wonderful opportunity to talk about uh, the, the synergy uh, and absolute bi-directional relationship between mental health and sleep, which Liz and Mel have beautifully uh, have been laying out for us. Uh, I think one of the things that you had mentioned we could touch on in this is our vision for what the future might look like in this area. And I sat back and I thought, well, what do I hope the future looks like in this area? And I think that the perspective that we take in our department is we'd really love to see a change in the narrative around mental health and problems like insomnia, sleep, and things like chronic pain. So why I say that is that I think that uh, for too long, uh, the narrative has been one that's been very disempowering for individuals that hasn't emphasized the fact that there's actually something that people can do. There are things that they can learn to do, uh, which we uh, touched on in, in earlier parts of the webinar, that will actually help and help them to have a mastery over some of these really tough chronic problems. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna revisit some of the points that I, I guess Mel, Mel and um, Liz have made in that kind of context, because for all of us, right across the community, I have to say, we're, we're all living in this world of waiting lists. We can't open a newspaper uh, or go online without reading about spiking levels of uh, demand and, and spiking levels of distress across the community. And very few of those articles, well, most of them talk about, well, actually, you know, what are we going to do? Well, we just need more clinicians. And when we say we just need more clinicians, like that's years away. It, it, it is very, it, it again, is something that is disempowering for individuals and very rarely do they ever talk about some of the online or digital options that both Liz and Mel have touched on uh, that are freely accessible uh, across the country and I'll, I'll uh, expand on in a moment. So it, it's clear that for sleep problems, for insomnia, that the cognitive behavioral therapy is the first line treatment and the best treatment. <laughs> I'll put that straight out, that it's, it's the best 
treatment. And look, particularly for young people, uh, and often uh, uh, when uh, the levels of distress are related to you know, real life stresses, financial concerns and anxiety. Why I say that is because I also think in an environment like this, we need to get real about what it means for someone to access help uh, in our system at the moment. And I always go back to this uh, very wonderful report by Lived Experience Australia that they published probably in 2021, so it's recent. And what they did is they surveyed a whole lot of Australians and uh, who were either had uh, lived experience themselves or were carers. And they asked them, well, what was your experience like? And they went through a whole, whole series of different questions. A great, uh, a fantastic report uh, for, uh, that I think every clinician should look at, but certainly uh, that anyone uh, uh, should look at and, and um, see. So, but uh, the key things that I think that uh, I want to raise are the fact that when someone asks for help, and usually they ask for help, and certainly when we, we're talking about anxiety disorders, they ask for help eight years in average of living with symptoms. So that's eight years of struggling before they actually ask for help. They sit down and the, and, uh, the, the survey came back and it said that almost 60% of those people were offered medication before there was any mention of any psychological treatment that might have been available for the concern that they were having. Now, that is actually the reverse of all of our clinical practice guidelines. So all of our clinical practice guidelines say the opposite, uh, but that actually doesn't seem to be what's happening in practice. And there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, and uh, we probably don't have time to, to necessarily explore that. The other things that came out were that when someone actually did ask for treatment or help, uh, they looked at the barriers. And of course, the barriers came back very strongly that uh, firstly, I might get a referral, but I can't get in. So I've got, I've been phoning people. I actually spoke to someone who'd phoned 23 psychiatrists before uh, they'd, uh, they'd, they'd managed to you know, have a chat with us. But uh, this is this is an issue because we, you know, uh, that a lot of people have their books closed. So there's waiting lists, and when people are on waiting lists, they typically get worse depending on uh, on uh, you know what what their their problem is. And the other thing that comes back very clearly is, of course, cost. And I always think it's important for us to actually talk about that because it's significant. Uh, and uh, they said that the average gap fee for a single session with a psychologist was one hundred and seventy six dollars. So that's what it costs out of pocket for the one session. And if someone has a difficulty, like some of the difficulties that we're talking about today, you need to see someone more than once. So you need to see them uh, often, quite frequently, until you have the chance to get uh, back on track and get back and enjoying whatever it is that you would like to enjoy. So I always like, I, like I start with that uh, because I think it's, it's actually important to have a bit of a frank conversation about what some of the realities of seeking help. Uh, can look like. And it also leads beautifully into the fact that in Australia we have uh, a third option. So uh, there's our traditional forms of psychological therapy, we've got medications that I'll touch on in a moment, but we of course have these digital options that both Mel and Liz have talked about. Uh, our, where we are, uh, we work uh, uh, with a program called This Way Up, and we specialise in creating programs that are accessible anywhere across Australia. They're available at any time. And they've all been tested, much like a medication, through randomised controlled trials. I know that Liz touched on uh, the trial for the insomnia program that we have and the wonderful results that it showed. So they've all been tested much the same way as a medication, so that when we say something works, we know that it does. And I think that... Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity like this today to actually raise awareness to people that there's actually this other option. Uh, and the whole aim of the programs are to empower individuals with the skills and information that will be helpful to help them to manage the problems that they're experiencing. One of the things, uh, of course, about sleep is that often the things that the average punter thinks will help make the problem worse. So it's perfectly rational that if you've been sleeping very poorly to think, I just need to be in bed. I need to be in bed longer. I'm going to go to bed at 7 p.m. and I'm not getting out until midday. 
Now, uh, it's uh, in our beautiful profession. This is something that's you know, nicely called sleep extension. Uh, sleep extension, and uh, what it does is it disconnects the idea of bed with sleep. So whilst it might seem logical to spend more time in bed, it's actually the opposite is what is needed to work through uh, and to uh, reduce your time in bed and to reassociate being in bed with being asleep and improve the quality of sleep. So it's these sorts of counterintuitive things that are beautifully laid out in the programs. And of course, uh, learning about, I, like, I call it sleep anxiety, where uh, all of us start worrying about or getting trapped in our thoughts about, oh God, you know, I've only had four hours sleep tonight. What am I going to do? I'm going to have a terrible day tomorrow, which of course is hyper arousal. It makes us more alert and it perpetuates the problem. And the program with mindfulness is a beautiful way to be able to disconnect from those thoughts. And of course, cognitive behavioral therapy and thought, the other types of um, managing our thoughts are just different ways of addressing that sort of problem. So they're really powerful tools and techniques. <laughs> So a few words, if I have time, Laura, on uh, I guess my thoughts really, I wanted to, to have a, a, just some thoughts about meds, uh, medications, because uh, I'm a psychiatrist, uh, I've worked as a GP, uh, I, was a, you know, I was a GP uh, for, for, for a while, and um, I know the feeling for doctors when you've got someone who is sitting there distressed in the consultation with you and you just have this longingness <laughs> to do something. And for, for so much of us as medical practitioners, we prescribe and that's appropriate. And prescribing may be appropriate in individual circumstances or it may not. So sedating medications, they work. <laughs> Uh, and look, you know, if I've got something extremely stressful like this live webinar, then <laughs> I may think <laughs> about trying to use a very judicious short term use of something that might help me to be able to sleep. Because as Liz started, we know that if people have sleep reduction, then we have, uh, you know, it affects our emotional state, it affects our concentration and memory. We know, we know that we've all experienced that. So short term, great. The issue that I always used to see is that I'd have people who would be coming in who had been on these medications for years. And this is a big problem actually across our society because uh, in many ways, uh, we just think that, you know, I've been taking this medication, my GP hasn't brought it up with me. I, you know, I go in and I get my repeat prescription and my quick chat and it's not addressed. So uh, there's a group in Wollongong that looked at some of the factors for why this might be the case. So the issue is, but uh, we know that the medications aren't effective after you've been taking them for several weeks. So we often talk about something called tolerance. So the dose that you were taking has stopped being as sedating or sedating as it was. And often at that point, people think, oh, I'll just take more. Uh, and this process can go on and you can get in quite a pickle actually with uh, these medications and they're quite close help to be able to reduce them down because of the way that they work. Uh, so it's very important that if you are in that situation, that this is something that you talk to your uh, healthcare practitioner about. But the other thing that strikes me and it struck me is that that's the, there can be a phys physical or physiological dependence, so the chemical, but you also have this psychological dependence that occurs. And what that means is that I associate the act of taking this tablet with, I then go to sleep. Now, so much of sleep is about ritual. <laughs> it's about you, you, if the people in the audience that have puppies or children, uh, you will know the routine is king and that doesn't go away when we get old. So uh, we can actually then, uh, it then becomes a ritual where we can take a medication that actually it, it doesn't, isn't necessarily doing what we need it to be doing. We don't necessarily need to be taking it anymore because the crisis has passed or things have improved. And so what happens is that when we don't take it, we can get anxious about not taking it. And this is often called something called rebound insomnia. So uh, these are the sorts of things that when doctors are, uh, if they've gone for prescribing, they're the sorts of things that should be discussed because the rebound insomnia is just the anxiety that I'm not taking the medication that night. Uh, it may not actually be 
an, a, an actual property of the medication because you lie down in bed and your brain goes, hang on a second, I thought you were supposed to take the tablet before you got to bed. And then suddenly your thoughts kick in and they're like, oh God, you know, I'm not going to sleep. I didn't take that tablet. And it can perpetuate the problem. So I think we have to be careful uh, uh, when and always think about the judicious use of, of some of these or of sedating tablets. And the last thing that I'll say, uh, just in thinking about medications, is often the medications interfere with the psychological skills because you actually aren't able to do the psychological skills if you're using some of these medications or they don't work as well because they work in opposites. So, and that's actually the same, whether it's in, you know, for anxiety, for people who have you know, mild um, problems with anxiety disorders, we often see that um, we want to move people toward um, uh, uh, learning about their anxiety and embracing their anxiety real and learning how to manage it rather than just thinking that it's a bad thing. And actually, sleep can be much the same. So uh, they're just some of the things that I guess I wanted to touch on. Uh, they may have prompted questions from the entire panel, uh, let alone the audience. Uh, hopefully, uh, I wasn't too controversial in anything that I said there. Thanks, Mike. No, not at all. Not at all controversial. Just um, yeah, honest and accurate. I, I would, I would say, um, and particularly with I mean years and years of experience and just um, either both in, within research and and the clinical setting of what 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 you've seen. So fantastic! It's great to hear from all our panelists. Um, as usual, of course, we always underestimate how much time we have, but we've got fifteen minutes left. So I'm just wondering that, and I was going to, you know, speak to the panel myself, but I feel like in justice to the audience, I might get straight to some of the questions that the audience um, have put into our chat and, and particularly some that have given their questions earlier. As I said, we won't get to them all, but I think I'll just start, um, I think we'll start with a couple. Um, and I, sh I, thought, I know that Melinda is happy to answer this one. And, and you, you did sort of cover it in your, um, chat your, your sort of section two um, from Sharon Melinda question I'd like to know more about the link between Alzheimer's and sleep so maybe when you certainly did I wonder if just a just a couple of just high level points on that thanks Mel yeah sure um yeah and I think you know this cognitive health kind of really comes under the umbrella of brain health as well and um, there's definitely links between sleep disturbances and different sleep disorders and um, cognitive decline, uh, so increased risk of mild cognitive impairment and, and dementia if, if you have an untreated sleep disorder. In terms of the context, in the context of Alzheimer's disease, um, these patients do experience a range of, of sleep disturbances, so they do have a, a high prevalence of sleep disorders like obstructive sleep apnea, um, but then more generally, they'll experience a lot of nocturnal awakenings. They just have challenges with their kind of sleep-wake timing and patterns. So it's a lot of dis circadian disruptions, which we haven't talked about much today, but it's another really important um, component of, of mental health as well. Um, and you've probably heard of sundowning, um, where there's kind of increased agitation in the early evening. Um, they also have poorer quality sleep, so less slow wave sleep, which is you know, a very important part of our, our sleep structure as well. Um, and in Alzheimer's disease, often um, the neurodegenerative processes occur in those sleep promoting um, areas of the brain, which can cause um, a lot of these. So it's sort of a biological um, cause of these sleep changes and that, that can be challenging to address. But also dementia, pay people living with dementia, they do also report you know, increased, um, you know, uh, yeah, thoughts and, and, and mental chatter in the evening as well. And so there is some um, opportunity, I think, to, to try and, and help um, some of these sleep issues through behavioural, um, like uh, cognitive behavioural therapy, for example. And, and my group are actually developing um, a, a sleep intervention for carers of people with dementia and, and, and um, people living with dementia as well um, to help hopefully address some of these issues. Thank you, Mel. Um, and I've, I've just been scanning all the questions at the previous ones and the ones currently here. Um, and I, I'll probably make a, a broad statement too that, uh, like for instance, the, the question on hypersomnia from um, Jacintha, that 
very, very, very important point. And I feel like to do justice to that, I would, I would imagine we'll, we're going to have monthly webinars free to the public, and we would definitely do a whole one on hypersomnia. Um, like people, yeah, that people who have just, uh, as just Cynthia said here, like people who sleep too much rather than having insomnia. Um, and I guess I can just say from my years, decades of clinical work before I did this job, um, and I've got quite a bit of expertise with people with hypersomnia, is that surprisingly to me, when I first started working in it, I, I couldn't believe that all my CBTI skills that I had were actually very appropriate to the people with hypersomnia. So I couldn't, I thought, what? What am I, this is crazy. Because I realized that's because the overnight sleep was very poor. There was very poor habits. There was sort of ha slapdash. There was so much sleepiness and so much sleeping that the same interventions kind of apply really. If you looked at CBTI, that is something I did all the time with people with narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia. So that's all, I'll leave it at that, for, but we'll do a whole webinar another time on, on hypersomnia. Um, I'll get to the question here from Thea too, one for Liz, as you've seen, I'm not sure if you've seen that, Liz. So it's the fact that there is reduced connectivity, well, I've just missed it, sorry, it's just gone up. Um, sorry, go back to it. Um, does the fact that the there is reduced connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex when sleep deprived mean that using self-talk approaches like is more difficult or less effective? So anyone can answer that, but if um, I'm happy to start and then love anyone else to, yeah. to join in. Um, right. So so no, I certainly wouldn't be concerned about it. We know that those self talk approaches, or maybe that the cognitive therapy element of of CBT for insomnia, is a really important part of CBT. In fact, cognitive therapy alone has been shown to be effective as a treatment for insomnia. So I wouldn't worry about it. Um, one, I mean, I would say that study I presented, you know, that was a whole night of full sleep deprivation. You know, it's, it's not exactly the same as 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 what happens in insomnia. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is, you know, my my guess would be, and I'd love it if, if anyone else on the panel has anything to back this up, that CBT or cognitive therapy is probably likely to strengthen those parts of the brain, the, the frontal lobes and the ability to help you regulate those emotions. Um, so uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be concerned. I think you know, use them. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mike, well, I wanted to ask you, uh, there were so many questions up, but I will, as I said, I, I will get to everyone at, at some point, but I think it's important because just enter again, um, sorry, I'm showing, uh, you know, favoritism, <laughs> but if, only because it's around melatonin. I think that's a lot of people always talk about you. I'd love your thoughts as a medical person on the panel about melatonin as opposed to sedatives or uh, alongside whatever. Yeah, look, it's got mixed evidence, so I'll say up front. Uh, and there's a mixed response between uh, ages uh, and individuals. Uh, it uh, One of the things is, though, that uh, a lot of people tend to think of it as a benign substance. Uh, and I have uh, unfortunately seen patients who have been on very, very high doses of melatonin. Uh, and... Uh, it is clear, actually, that the, there's some harms that are related to that. Uh, so the, the research is very clear that it's the lower doses and uh, that, um, that if they are effective and certainly in shift work and so on, that's, that's generally where the thoughts are. The other thing I'll say is it's very rare that people use melatonin the way it's supposed to be used. So they very rarely take it at the time of day that they should be taking it. Uh, you, you know, if people instead you will take a melatonin at 10 p.m. at night and think, oh, this should be, uh, what, what, why isn't this working for me? When really it's, it's taken much earlier in the evening if we're looking at uh, a return to our normal circadian rhythms. Uh, so I think that, and also, uh, again, to confuse it even more, uh, if you buy melatonin over the counter in the chemist, uh, you're buying something that has a homeopathic dose of melatonin in it that's, you know, a millionth of the strength that we would uh, if we were, uh, when we have to get it compounded. Uh, so it's only available compounded. Uh, there's, of course, cicadin, uh, which is a, 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 a variant in, in a way, or, uh, which is available. Uh, and uh, there's some evidence to suggest that it's more helpful for older adults. Uh, I think that on a scale of badness, uh, I think it's high, It's better than sedatives. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and again, for short term and judicious use, uh, and talk to your clinician about it to make sure you're using it properly. Talk to the pharmacist so that you're using it properly. So that if you are using it, you get the benefit. Fair enough? Yeah. Yes, fantastic. Um, so many questions, especially the ones pre-webinar that are already there. I just want to make a comment to you on some of like, how do I ensure uninterrupted uninter sleep? How do I catch up on lost sleep? Those sorts of things. I'll put that to the panel, actually, because I, I'll around the question around uninterrupted sleep, I would say don't don't go there. You are going to have an interrupted sleep. Like that's yeah, one of our exactly things. Exactly my <laughs> yeah. And and so what about so I'm putting that to the panel and also catching up on lost sleep. That's I'd love your thoughts on that because I've got some as well, but I'll go to you, anyone. I mean, Liz and I talked about this earlier, and we're just going to say, forget about the whole idea of uninterrupted sleep. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. it's to it, Laura. Yeah. It's so it. I think it's important to, to know that normal sleep involves interruptions, yes. um, and the, the number of interrupt, uh, interruptions increases with age. And if those are brief interruptions, they're nothing to be concerned about. If those are longer interruptions, um, then, then perhaps you, know, you would be considering cognitive behavioural therapy insomnia to assist you with them you know particularly probably the time in bed restriction components mel do you want to add to that i'll add, I'll add to that that often uh, uh people are pretty lousy at working out how disruptive their sleep is you know mm -hmm. uh so if we so typical cognitive bias you overestimate the danger you underestimate your inability your ability to cope it's the same as sleep it's like there is evidence that uh you actually misperceive the interruptions in your sleep to be much larger than they may have necessarily been. So uh, it's also something that's important to, to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Some, I guess something that Mike touched on in his presentation was around, um, you know, this paradoxical idea of, you know, reducing your time in bed to increase your sleep. Um, and so sometimes we need to kind of consolidate and condense our, our sleep time to try and improve the quality of our sleep. And so perhaps increasing your sleep drive um, and going to bed a little bit later than you normally would might help to, to kind of um, improve that sleep quality and, and reduce the number of um, disruptions. But you know, this is a general comment and, you know, yeah. you really need to have kind of individualised advice um, depending oh. on the situation. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, a lot of, uh, probably a good thing um, to, to put to the panel is just we've got all this information, got heaps of evidence, right? It's, it's, and, and it can be a bit scary. And I love Liz earlier said, look, don't, don't panic about the odd poor night's sleep. But a lot of but the stuff, this is the thing about uh, Sleep Health Foundation. We've, we've got this big problem with sleep, but also we're in charge or we're trying to have these public messages and what do you think in a nutshell really like well, how do people what do we do then I mean are we saying because of the waiting list along etc that you don't know, really embrace digital technologies as as it what's, what's the first line really of what people do when they're concerned about their sleep I mean I've got just a sort of a just your, there's no right or wrong answers but where are we at, I guess, with um, as a society and as people in general? Yeah, how, how, do, how do they approach it? So to, to the general public, what do they do first? Is, is it a GP question or is it a self-help question? Obviously, how do they know how do they know the severity themselves when they're not professionals? Yeah. Thoughts? Mike? <laughs> courses for courses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, the background. Like we've got to drop the idea that doing an all-nighter is a good thing for work and a badge of honour and, you know, bravado and um, and uh, get an idea that this is a core component of uh, the foundations of looking after ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that might mean a lousy night's sleep and that's okay. Might I mean, run a lousy night's sleep. Uh, I think, um, uh, I, I mean... Coming to first great starting point is uh, obviously Sleep Health Foundation websites because a whole lot of amazing yes. information and resources on there. Uh, and then of course uh, the you know the website that Melinda talked about and come to this way up. We've got lots of information around what might be uh, helpful to help people understand what might be normal or what might be some of the concerning signs that is abnormal. 
So we know that if it's something that goes on for a longer period of time, if it's something where our mood is going down, if, our, if, if we start to develop the other symptoms that might suggest that there's, a, there's, there's difficulties that, that could be addressed, then, uh, then it's time to act. And as I say, that the first, a great step in acting is actually go to the digital programs, you'll learn about sleep, you'll learn about what it might be like if you go on to need more intensive treatment. So it's a step on the way uh, whilst waiting to get into a sleep clinic, whilst waiting for a sleep study, whilst waiting to get into a psychologist, so that you start to learn about the ideas and principles. And sometimes they're tricky to to implement and sometimes people are like, wow, you know, I get this. And then they don't need to progress onto the more intensive services and can free up that slot for someone who might need it more. And, and just to add that, certainly I do think GP can be a great first port of call and can help direct you to what might be useful. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. I think, yeah, horses are courses and it's a probably difficult question to put out. It's, it's the last two minutes, but it's just more <laughs> just as the, <laughs> the summary, really. I think that was really useful for, you know, just for just sort of bring it to a close. Um, we could talk for, you know, we could have done two hours after all, for sure, but we'll keep it short. We'll keep it to the, you know, it's exactly 12 right now. Yeah. Um, just put the slide up here for those of you, particularly those asking about how we're going to know about the webinars, make sure you follow us on the, on our, on the, all the usual social platforms. If you've seen, you know, put the QR, put your phone up to the QR code while it's up there to subscribe to our newsletter. Um, have a look at what we have on our website. We're going to really build our resources. Um, and have, you know, really good digital, uh, it's like ha having videos like this, having conversations. Um, our webinar next month is actually a group of people with lived experience of poor sleep and sleep disorders, and, and they're talking about their path to diagnosis and, and all the challenges, so that'll be something to watch as well, for sure. So yeah, thank you very much to the fabulous panellists. I really appreciate your time and your expertise, and generosity. Um, and thank you very much to all the audience. Thank you so much for coming and your interest in this. And um, yeah, well, stay tuned for the next ones and farewell. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura.